This broadcast brought to you by Alltech, naturally. Today, I'll be talking a little bit more about the, um, the multicultural millennial segment. And uh, it's actually some of the videos Andy presented, very, very comical, and, but then at the same time, very true. And we'll get down to the psyche of them a little bit more and, and, and talk a little bit more deeply. I was personally touched because I am from Miami, so um, I was the guy in the yacht and all these other things. So I can never have a, a chicken farm, so I have to stick with advertising for the, for the years to come. Um, it's really a brave new world when we talk about the the multicultural millennial. The, this segment, which is uh, one of the fastest growing segments, it is the largest, one of the largest segments of the population, uh, which is 77 million strong. Um, it's continuing to grow uh, daily, and they are uh, of a different mindset. When we get into the math of that, and if you start thinking about the diversity of that segment as well, uh, it gets even greater, right? 20% uh, of this subsegment is Hispanic. 15% um, is African American, 5% Asian. That's, that's basically what most people perceive as the multicultural segment of the pop population. These are the, the bigger numbers. That's cumulative 40% of that 77 uh, million, so we're talking about, you know, plus or minus 30 million people, right? The size of Canada, you know, of the entire population of Canada. So it's a fairly robust segment that we're looking at. One of the things I want to point out is the Hispanic population, which is 20% of that, which technically, or 20% of the full segment, right? So it's technically of the multiculturals, it's half of them really 50% of those multiculturals. Uh, so they have a strong influence on anything and everything that you're going to be seeing. Everything from music to tastes to so forth. So they are the most racially and ethnically diverse segment of all. And not only are they diverse, but they are also the most accepting and appreciative of other cultures. They have been raised in the, in, within the segment and the, the idiosyncrasies. They were raised, they're the first generation to have a black uh, president. They were one of the first generations to really enjoy Mexican food. Who doesn't enjoy a good Cinco de Mayo celebration, right? You know, a great Chinese New Year. All those things have influenced the way that they were raised. So with that, the mindset is different. They're not traditionalist, per se. In comparison with the baby boomers, they're much more accepting, right? So we have to think of that. So now let's also think about not only who they are, but where are they? How can we reach them, right? It's all parts of our marketing segmentations. Well, to no surprise, knowing that half of them are Hispanic, you're going to see the, the markets that are primarily Hispanic, right? So you're going to see heavily on the west, southwest, all throughout Texas. And even more so, you're also going to see because of where their parents moved initially uh, for work purposes and so forth, you're going to see a movement to the urban areas. Um, within this, the markets that are over-indexing or that have a, a heavier population than normal within this millennial segment we're looking at Austin, San Diego, Salt Lake City, LA, Denver, and so forth. To no, not much of a surprise there. I think one of the things important, I, I have to ask this question, how many of you guys have a millennial living with you right now? Okay, I want you to know they're not leaving. I really want you to know that they're there for a while. They're going to be home for a while, so get ready. They won't leave. Nearly 30... Pardon me? They're like boomerangs. Yeah, they go, and leave. they go and come back, right? They go and come back. They make it... No, they, we don't like it. Mom does better cooking at home, so I think I'm going to move back in. We know that. Um, interestingly enough, 31% of all millennials 
right? They uh, still live with their parents. Hispanic millennials are even higher, 45%, nearly 50%, one in every two are still living with their parents. So think about that household for a second. It's multi-generational. Now you got the kids, the moms, and the grandparents all living together in one household. So how do you make sure that you get on that grocery cart? That's going to be very important. And to my point earlier, two-thirds have been asked, and they said, eh, we're not moving out anytime soon until I'm ready. We'll see when that is. Next, here's where, again, Hispanic influences play a very strong role. Not to say that all cultures don't appreciate their family, but as you guys probably well know and have heard, Hispanics are all about the family. So being a good parent is the ultimate, most important thing to them. This is based on uh, asking of, you know, what are the most things that are important in your life? Family was number one at 63% and that it is their responsibility to take care of their parents. So the good thing is that while they may not be leaving, they may be taking care of us a little later on, so we're good. So with this, also, let's talk a little bit about what they think about their health and how this is going to influence their, their shopping behaviors, right? So, if anything, millennials uh, care about programs that help them manage their well-being and their healthier choices. And whether they're not sure what side of the ACA you are on the uh, Affordable Care Act, uh, they are very pro-health care. They are concerned about what they're uh, putting in their body, as we saw in Andy's video earlier, really concerned about where that chicken came from and if it had a good psychological background. So with that, let's talk a little bit about how they shop, how they think, when they shop. They're very savvy. These are shoppers that are always looking for a very good deal. Why? Well, for the very same reason they're still living at home. These guys grew up and graduated at the peak point of economic depression. Right, so most of them are economically challenged. My daughter has a boyfriend who has not had a job for nearly a year now. I titter and wonder myself on whether it's really that he doesn't want a job or does he cannot find a job, but that's a different conversation for a couple of drinks. But one thing that they're not willing to do is sacrifice on quality. And we'll see that, and, and we did uh, an extensive study over the course of this past summer where we visited uh, numerous of households throughout the United States that sat down in the kitchens and got down and, and rolled up our sleeves and watched them cook and everything. And freshness is the utmost important word that came out of their mouth every time without fail. So quality is ultimately important. At the same time, they want the latest thing and they're willing to do impulse purchases. So if you think about that for a second, is they want high quality, they're willing to spend money on a dime if they find the right quality and is the latest thing. So when we talk about gluten, and, and again, Andy pointed out very clearly, you know, yeah, there are going to be new trends and new words coming out later on. Um, it is important to note that we have to stick with the trends. We got to know what is the thing that's important to them because those are the things that matter. You know, we, to a certain degree, um, Stony Farm did, uh, did this exact same thing. You know, they, they came out, they were very adamant about uh, how they process their products and uh, eventually people started catching on and they, they fell into this plan. But he, they saw that, and it's important that we understand what those trends are and that we see it into the future a little bit. So where do they shop? Well, again, if you're going to go for high quality and you're, not, and you're okay with spending a little bit more money to get that quality, well, you may not necessarily go to the traditional places. So grocery stores, if you'll notice, they're less likely to go to a grocery store than they are to go to 
most other than most other segments, right? So millennials, if you'll notice, is on the left side, and obviously the other subsegments, 35 plus, are on the right side. They are uh, more of a big box retailer. Those are more of a economical, right? But they they are willing to find them. And then there's specialty stores as well. They're very high there, and clubs memberships as well. So interesting, different reasons for going to these different uh, stores. I was going to start by saying, again, that there, this generation is one that everybody's kind of trying to figure out. In fact, we can start by stop calling them so many names and let's figure out one. It was at one point it was Generation Y, another point is uh, millennials, the do-gooders, the uh, the good doers, whatever you want to call them. But uh, they are um, a generation that's been uh, misinterpreted to a certain degree, but we're catching up, I think. Well, they're skeptical. They're skeptical for a lot of reasons. They did grow up in, um, in as, as I mentioned earlier, in a point of time where yeah, there weren't jobs for them. Uh, so they are, they feel like, many of them did feel that they got burned. Um, so, you know, they went to school, they invested their money, they came out, and there was nothing there for them. So that skepticism translated into them saying that they're willing to buy a brand because they support a cause. This really stood out for them because um, capitalism is not something that's important to them. It's not at the heart of them. Now, they're all about making money, but only if they don't have to work too hard at it. Right, so they want to become the the, the next um, uh, Facebook. They want to become that next um, Etsy. Uh, but you know, if it falls on their lap, it'd be nice. Um, so what do they do? They stand for causes. They stand strong for it. So the way that they see companies is very different from how we see companies in general. They see companies because of that skepticism that. Those companies need to be giving back. They have to do something more than just take it in, right? So they're willing to, to look at those brands. 47% say that they're, they're buying a brand every month because of that. And with those brands, we see some of their success. Tom's, Ben & Jerry's, the Ben & Jerry's Foundation, the Panera Cares, all those are, are brands that have reached out to this segment and said, hey, we, we're giving back. We're doing it our way. Some are going to the extent now that it's not about what the company gives back to one company. The company's opening it up and said, we'll give to whoever you want us to give back to. So that even makes it a little bit greater because now that creates a relationship because it's about you and who you want that money to go to. The most important part of that is that they're willing to spend more. So when they're sitting in front of that freezer case or in front of the aisle and they're looking at what am I going to purchase, they're willing to spend another dollar on a brand just because they know that that brand is doing right by giving back to their community. Even more so if that is giving back because of they're doing right with the environment. The Honest Company, which uh, Jessica Alba is a big proponent of, and as my understanding, she wasn't really the founder, just a little anecdote. She was, I think, passed a little briefcase with about $6 million. But um, I'm just saying, I'm not, you didn't hear it from me. Nonetheless, uh, the Honest Company, it, it is all about that, right? And they've been very successful in doing so. And so we can see some of those case studies right there. So then, if this is where they're going, how do we connect? And we talked a little bit earlier with Andy, and, and um, I'm sure Jeff yesterday, Jeff Frum, uh, who we work with actually on uh, some businesses, uh, talked a little bit about how do we connect with this consumer. Obviously. And you guys will know, these are the most connected consumer of all. They grew up with PlayStation, all, you know, laptops, iPads, iPhones, things that you had and I didn't have. Do you guys remember carrying that big case with the big giant telephone? And that was the cellular phone? 
Okay, so maybe I'm older than you guys. All right, because I remember. Anyway, so when we look at that, um, Hispanic millennials are 66% more likely to have connectivity, um, even more so than just all millennials, right? So when we look at that sub-segment, that 50% that we talked about of, uh, of the multiculturals, Hispanics are much more likely to have a mobile device in hand and be shopping with that, okay? And they're twice as likely to own a tablet. So they're always connected. So if they're connected, what are they connecting to? Well, of the top 20 applications that are on your phone, the apps that are on your phone or on your iPad, most of them, or all of them, are either retail-focused or discount-focused, okay? So, and you'll see even Target, which is right in the middle of that, and uh, the blue one, it only has about 2 million uh, unique audience followers, okay, or downloads. Um, but the rest are really about discounting, they're about shopping. So these guys are really in, into getting in their mobile device and doing the research and doing the discounting and doing the shopping. And the social media plays a huge role. Years back, we used to say, well, if you don't have a website, right, then you don't exist. Well, today, with this segment, you don't have a Facebook page, you don't exist to them, right? Website it's a standard, it's almost like having, you know, four walls around you. It's important. You have to have it. You have to communicate. You know, but Facebook is something that's ultimately important. They live and breathe by it. They believe what's in it. And he talked a little bit earlier about, um, you know, the, how people just post stuff in there. And, and people just take that in as gospel. And the reality is we have to be very transparent, very clear about what we communicate and then also be very engaging you know, because they are collecting a lot of news data, a lot of information that they're friends and, and taking that through, through social media. The good part is that once they become involved with you as a company, as a product developer, they're willing to talk about your product. So they were going to become your next big brand ambassador. This is kind of like having a PR department. All you got to have is somebody on Facebook. Millennials are more likely to favor brands that are on Facebook pages. So right there alone gives you a leg up. They're avid users of technology. There's no surprise. When interacting with companies uh, via social media, they like to have a personal and direct relationship. They really believe that once they connect with you, on, on, they like you on Facebook, that now they have an open line of communication. I actually have a friend that um, had some trouble with their electric company. They accidentally cut off his uh, electricity. They, he called customer service. Customer service um, told him, hey, you know, there's really nothing I can do. It's going to take 24 hours. He posted on Facebook what the customer service uh, representative said. Light went back up in two hours. <laughs> Go figure, right? Um, Now let's get down to what do they eat? What do they like? They're all about the experience. Again, these guys grew up, as you guys may know, being rewarded for participating in soccer games and not winning the Little League, but they still got a trophy. So everything's about the experience for them. You know, we go do something, we're going to enjoy it. So they do. They look for, especially with the dining experience, and this is really cultural. Again, Hispanics have a strong skew here uh, or an influence within the segment where um, you're looking at them wanting to experience new places. They're looking for flavors. It, every day there's new cultural influence uh, of flavors. Uh, right now, there's a big movement going on in the frozen entrees, right? If you look at, you know, the frozen entrees, the evils, all these uh, healthier for you uh, foods trying to take back the, the frozen aisle. And 
they're doing it with some very unique flavors, whether it's uh, Mexican foods or uh, very d different uh, ethnicities. And they're always looking for the great atmosphere. They're all about the enjoyment. 14% of millennials are first generation, 12% are second generation. So they're not that far removed from their roots, right? They're not far removed at all, which means that they have direct access to the recipes. Their influence, again, if you're in one of those multi-generational households, you got grandmother cooking who's got, you know, several years of, uh, you know, bringing recipes and so forth from their homeland. So we have to understand what are those recipes. There are some ingredients in there that we normally wouldn't necessarily um, look to, but they do. So they're, the, you know, they're looking at you know, chipotles and, and all these other different uh, ingredients that influence the, uh, their taste. Grandmothers and mothers within these households are ultimately important. Well, they are the primary shoppers, and there's a whole conversation on how those uh, moms have kind of really taken a big role. They are now the CEO of the, of the household. So they're the ones making the final decision of what gets inside that cart, right? So millennials become more of an influencer of what gets in the cart. They're not necessarily the shopper as much. Mom ends up being the gatekeeper. But again, food is about, it's not just about nourishment for them. It's about the experience. So when you talk to them about food, it can't be just, you know, this is good for you. But this is what it will do for you emotionally, right? So, and, and we talked about, <laughs> again, the video was very funny. I think the, the opportunity of presenting our products in a light that is, not only right for, for you nutritionally, but also right for you for the things that you believe in are those things that are important there. Entertaining. It's about personal storytelling. Uh, we'll talk in a second about taste tracing. You know, how, how do we get that um, story conveyed about your products, the, the, uh, what's all behind it? They want to know about that. They're living at home with mom. They kind of fantasize a little bit about what's going on back at the farm. Publish pictures of what they eat. Who hasn't taken a picture of their plate? Anyone? I know I do it all the time. Actually, one of our digital directors, I created an entire uh, Twitter account on uh, Miami Flavors, and he's got, I think, every restaurant by now in Miami. Um, they follow food celebrities on Twitter. They're all about that experience. At the same time, they're the most informed customers that you'll ever have, at least for the moment. They're, they shop with their phone in hand. If they don't know something, they're looking it up. At the same time, Jimmy Kimmel proved to us that they're very trendy, so to speak, but they forget a little bit about the detail, maybe a little too much information for them. But um, ingredient tracing is important. We did some focus groups recently, um, again, trying to get a better understanding of how they felt about uh, companies being transparent and revealing the ingredients and the taste tracing. And they're all about it. We sat down and the moment we put the product in front of them, they were grabbing and flipping it over and reading the, the, the nutritional values. And everybody had an opinion about uh, gluten. Everybody had an opinion about uh, how much sugar the product should have. Some were quoting numbers, which to me, was uh, surprising because some of them knew exactly how much sugar that should be in that product. Now, point being that we have to help them because, yeah, unfortunately, they're not as well informed as they think they are. So we have to help them a little bit understand what is really better for them. Transparency is important. And transparency within that is really letting them, you know, see what's behind the door. You know, they hear all these horror stories. Yes, unfortunately, Facebook posts all these horrible uh, videos and these horrible things, and we know that that's an exception within the rule. But unfortunately, it's what gets passed along because it's the sensationalism of social media. So what we have to do is have to 
put a lid on that and really push forward more the, the, the reality of what's going on. And this is a brave new world. But in the words of Aldous Huxley, you know, we have to bring that data forward. Facts do not cease to exist just because they are ignored. So take these facts, take what we know, and use it. Use, know that they are the fastest growing segment of the population. They're not going away. We've got to figure out how to, how to feed them. At the same time, they are the most unique group because they are so diverse, right? So we have to get into the cultural segmentation and understand the cultural differences. There's a big difference between providing ingredients or products for Asians than it is for Hispanics. At the same time, they're consumers with a conscience. They want to know that you're not just putting money in your pocket, that you are giving back, that you are doing something else for, for the environment, that you're doing something else for someone else other than yourself. So they're willing to spend more in you if you're willing to spend more in us. They want authentic relationships. They want to know if you tweet hey, you turned off my light, I need it back on, I got a baby at home, that you're going to be able to get on that social media and go, we're on it, right? At the same time, they don't want to work too hard for it, you know, make it easy for me. They're all about convenience, right? So if packaging, think about your packaging, think about making that simple for it. Okay. They grew up with a microwave, they did not grow up with a stovetop, right? So make that easy for them. And remember, technology is at their fingertips every step of the day. They never leave their phone. Matter of fact, my daughter's starting to grow an eyeball right here because she walks around like this all day. So now she doesn't run into signs anymore.